Hello, welcome to the video for what is the main material, material property. I've gone ahead and I've pulled up the material itself. We're going to cover the material section of the main material. You can of course access this by clicking anywhere on the background or on your main material itself. So let's go ahead and get started. One thing to keep in mind, and this is important, is materials are not only intended for use on meshes. Yes, they are a texture on your character, for example, or your building, but materials can also be used on other things, such as a lighting reflection or a lighting model. They can be used to be the particle in your particle effect, such as fire or smoke. They have other uses other than just texturing an object. They are, like I said, they're compiled down into shaders, so they are what determines how stuff looks in your game. And that stuff includes everything, even your user interface can use a material. So that's important when we're going through these sections. So let's start with the first one. The first one is our material domain. This is our primary use for this shader. Now, if you notice down here, we have instructions. Base pass shader with only dynamic lighting, 60 instructions, vertex shader instructions, and how many texture samplers we're using. If I disconnect and let it recompile, basically anything that's hooked up is what's determined here. So since I'm no, no longer using a texture and a color and multiply nodes and some constants, I have less instructions that are being used. Now, your material domain determines your base shader that's behind the scenes, your template that you're going to be using and what it can and cannot do. So by default, we have surface, which is your normal texture, which is on the surface of an object. Other than that, we have deferred decal, which is intended to be used when you are doing a decal and you need to material use them. It is the material that's used for decals, and decals are basically stickers placed on top of surfaces. Light function. Basically, this is a material that's used in a light function. You can go ahead and... If you're using light functions, you need to set the material domain to light function. Post process. Basically, if you're using a custom post process pass, you'll go ahead and use the post process domain. And then user interface, which is the domain if you're using a slate or a UMG widget. Now, if you notice over here, we have all of our options. And by default, these are the ones that are enabled for input. If we change this over to D for decal, you're going to notice certain things are disabled and certain things enabled. We're also going to notice our instructions down here may or may not change. Like right now, we have 31 instructions for the base pass and the vertex. If we change this to a light function, you're going to notice we now drop down to 17 instructions, and you're notice the only thing enabled is emissive color. Same thing if we change to post process. Same thing if we chose to use your interface. Now, one big difference here, you're going to notice all of these options here. When we change this to user interface, it immediately drops down to nothing else. User interface is something that's special because it's got its own pass. Basically, it's a special instructor. It's a UI shader, and it only has these options for opacity, opacity, mask, and then the final color that you're going to be using for your material. So if you're using a user interface and you want to have a custom material, let's say, for example, your user interface is part of your environment. You're going to have a 3D text widget, but you want that text to glow. You want it to be emissive. Well, then you would make sure you have the user interface domain set up, and you would go ahead and set up an emissive output, and then there you go. So let's go ahead and change this back to surface so we can cover the other options. The next one is our blend mode. This basically determines how things are blended with your other objects. Basically, opaque is the final source color. Under that, we have masked, which is basically, it's a bit. It is either on or off. This is something important. If you want something, for example, like a checkerboard pattern where it's black and white and it's got a clear definition of what is on or off, then you're going to use mast. Now, this little drop down arrow here, when we turned on mast, let's take it back to opaque, you'll notice opacity mask clip value. It's disabled. 
When we turn this on masked, we're going to now have an option for the opacity mask clip value to be adjusted. If you're not using a black and white or an on or off bit masked mask, then the opacity mask clip value is used. Let's say you have a gradient where it goes from black to white with shades of gray in between. The mask clip value, basically if the value is below this, it's not going to be rendered. So you can still use a blended or a uh, textured non-black and white mask and still have it work in the basic function by adjusting your clip value. So keep that in mind, if you are using a mask and it's not giving you the right results, or you want some sort of a translucency and it's not giving you the right results, maybe it's too harsh, you might be using masked where you want to actually use translucent. Translucent is what is your traditional thought of a slow gradient going from black to white. Translucent allows you to have those gray shades and have it be clear, not clear, or partially translucent or opaque. Underneath that we have additive. Additive basically takes the source color and the destination color and puts them together and you get the additive for your blend mode. This blend mode is not compatible with dynamic lighting so that's one thing to keep in mind. Our last one is modulate. Modulate takes the source color, multiplies it by the destination color and you end up getting a result. You could basically think of this like your multiply node in Photoshop. Now you're immediately going to notice two errors when we turn on modulate. Translucency is not supported and translucency is not supported. What that means is you need to not use a default lit shading model if you're using modulate. It needs to be unlit. When you have unlit set, you no longer have translucency or opacity as an option. Therefore, it's going to work perfectly fine. Our next option, error here is separate translucency with modulate is not supported. If we scroll down to translucency, then bring up our little advanced options, we're going to find separate translucency. This was covered in our translucency video, but basically if we uncheck this, we no longer have a separate translucency pass for this material. Everything's done in the first pass, and that error is going to go away. So if you want to use modulate, you need to make sure separate translucency is disabled. You need to make sure you're using an unlit shader model because we do not want any form of translucency. So we'll go ahead and set this back to default so we can cover the next section. Under this we have our decal blend mode. This is only used if we have deferred decal turned on. And this just basically determines how our blend, our decal is blended into its surface. Translucency, stain, normal, emissive, and there's a ton of other options. Basically, you play with these depending on how you want your blend, your decal to blend in. Maybe you have blood, like, like here's an example. Let's say you have a tag. You're playing something like Counter-Strike and you have a graffiti tag. You're going to want that to go on top of it, and you're going to want it to be on top of the surface. But let's say you have something like blood, which has, you want to be more blended into your surface, then you're going to want to use a different blend mode in order for it to blend into the surface rather than being looking like it's a sticker on top. So your blend mode determines how it looks on the surface itself when you're using a decal. Under that we have our shading model. Now our shading model determines in the background a lot of smaller tweaks. By default you have default lit. This will absorb light and you have shadows that can be cast. Let me go and hook up my base color here. And we're going to go ahead and see a pink model. And we see a little bit of a specular reflection here and some light. That is our default lit model. If we change this to unlit, you're immediately going to see a difference. You're not going to see any color because there is no light on this surface. Unlit means lighting does not affect it. And it does not have a shadow cast on it. It has no specular. It simply has no lit. It's not lit. That's why you also notice emissive, world position, and pixel depth are the only ones left. Generally unlit is if you want something to be emissive. Let's say for example a neon sign or something like that. That's what unlit is for. Now if you notice I've plugged into emissive and we now have something emitting. 
because we're using the emissive channel. So that's what unlit would be used for. Unlit's also good, for example, for you'll notice that's what your user interface domain is for. We'll take this back to default lit. We'll go to our next one, subsurface. Subsurface is if you want to use subsurface scattering. It's for like skin and things like that. You'll notice you'll have subsurface color unlocked, and that is what the subsurface shading model does. It it adds a couple things behind the scenes that allows you to emulate things like wax and ice and things like that. Under that you have the skin, which is basically like subsurface, but it's got a few other tweaks in there to give it more of an undercoating glow, which you can kind of see here. Other than that, we have clear coat, which is intended to emulate a clear surface on top of an underlying surface. So like the coating on a sports car or something like that. That's what clear coat does. Under that, we have subsurface profile. Basically, this is like the subsurface shader, except it uses built-in profiles, which can emulate other things like subsurface scattering. And this is a completely separate thing where you do pre-built subsurface profiles. You'll notice the subsurface profile unlocks here when we change to it. Under that, we have two-sided foliage. Again, this is another custom shader that's intended to help emulate two-sided foliage. It allows lights to pass through one side and give you a little bit of a glow effect on the back surface of a leaf or something like that, or grass. So by default, we'll leave this at default lit. Now, one thing you will find is as time goes on, Unreal will add more shading models. In 4.11, which is not released yet, they're going to be adding a few more for like hair and skin to give better pre-built shading models to better emulate good looking hair and things like that. So your shading model is your basis. Your material domain is your template is how it works. Okay, under this we have our two sided. If you're looking at a surface and let's say it's a box. You're only going to see the outside of the box, so you don't have to worry about two-sided. You're only seeing the outside. You're seeing where the normals are facing. Let's say, for example, though, you have a leaf. Now, you're going to want to see the front and the back of the leaf. Normally, the back of the leaf would be cold, though, because it's the back and it's not being seen. If you turn on two-sided, it's going to basically render the front and the back side, and then the normals will be flipped to show on the back. And it's useful for things that are two-sided, like foliage. Use material attributes. This is an option to turn on material attribute pins, which will be covered in another video. But basically, if you notice here, we have our normal output and input. If we turn on material attributes, this will turn it into a material attribute input, and that's a way to use a material function inside of another material, and that will be covered in another video. So underneath this, we have our advanced options. We're going to go ahead and click on the correct ones first, and we'll open up our advanced options section. Here we have our decal response. Basically, this determines how decals are drawn on our material. And by default, it's color normal roughness. And that's what it's going to be. We covered our opacity mask clipping. Again, that's only turned on when we have masking enabled. Underneath, underneath that, we have dithered LOD transition. Basically, LODs determine how something looks in ter its level of detail. So let's say, for example, you have a house, and the house is very detailed because you're looking at it. As you get farther away from it, you may swap in a lower level of detail model with less polygons, so that way it saves on resources and your game performs better. Since you're not up close to it, you don't really need to see the fact that there is wooden stairs or there is a overhang or doorknob or things like that on the actual model. Now, dithered LOD is intended for use on foliage. So let's say you have plants. Let's say you have a bush, for example. Let's say you have three LODs on the bush. One that looks really good when you're up close to it where you can see the individual leaves and flowers. As you get farther away, it eventually turns into like a billboard or something where it's just a, a round blob that has a color that represents a bush. Now, normal LOD transitions are 
instant. If you go from a higher LOD to a lower LOD, it immediately will snap between the two different models, and it's kind of a rough appearance. Dithered LOD basically gives it kind of a stair-stepping effect where pixels, instead of the whole thing changing at once, pixels will fade in or out as it's switching, so it kind of gives it where it's a fade-in effect rather than an instant effect. And it, it gives it a nice little appearance for your foliage as you're moving through the world. So if you're going to use foliage and you want to give, and you're using LODs, you want to turn this on. Number of customized UVs. These are customized UVs if you're doing materials that need more than one UV set. By default it's zero, but let's say we change it to three. You're going to notice over here, you're going to now have three more inputs for customized UVs. So if you need a material that has or needs customized UVs in order to do some math operations, that's where you would turn them on. Generate spherical particle normals. Basically, the this is intended primarily for particle effects. Because like I said, keep in mind, materials are not just on meshes and things like that. You could put materials inside of particle effects and other uses. So if you're using a particle and you have a material in there, by default, you're simply going to use a non-spherical particle normal, which means the normal is basically always going to face the camera because they're sprites, and that's just how it works. If you generate spherical particle normals, basically it's going to turn it more into a spherical volume appearance, so you'll get more light play and you'll get more depth off of your normals on your particle itself. You only need to turn this on if you're using normals on your particle and you need to get more of a lit effect that's from more than one direction rather than just always facing the camera. So that's what the spherical particle normals do. It's easy enough to turn on and off and see the effect. Tangent space normal. This is your default for the normal on this material. By default, it's tangent space, which means the Z is always going to be up is how that's going to work. Now, if you uncheck this, it's going to end up using world space normals. By default, tangent space normals is a little more computationally expensive, but it's the normal way of doing normals. If you're doing normals a different way, where you need them in world space rather than in the local space, the tangent space, then you would uncheck this option. Make sure your normal map is built for world normals. That's important. And then you'll go ahead and be able to use your, t your world space normals instead of your tangent space normals. This is an artistic switch. Basically, you'll know if you need to use it or not. If you need tangent or world space normals inside your material. Emissive dynamic area light. Basically, if you're using light propagation volumes, do you want this emissive color, assuming you're using an emissive color, to be added to the light propagation volume. Basically, do you want it to look like this? Let's say, for example, you have a neon sign. If you have a neon sign and that light should affect things outside of it, then you're going to want to turn this on. Let's say it's a circuit board, for example, and it's just simply used as a decoration or an artistic effect, then you wouldn't want to turn this on because you simply want it to look like there is a solid line there or a solid color rather than something that actually emits light. So if you're using, if, if you want this color that's emissive to kind of give a glow effect and then affect other things inside of your light propagation volume, then you want to go ahead and check this. Block global illumination. Basically, how much global illumination is blocked based on the opacity of this item. If you have a solid item, then it's going to block the global illumination completely. If it's not solid, you know, it's partially translucent, then global illumination is going to shine through it. If you want it completely disabled, then you leave it off. If you basically want global illumination to be affected by the opacity on this actual item, then you want to go ahead and turn this on. You'll know if you need it or not. For the most part, you can disable this. Global illumination is one of those things that is kind of an artistic choice and it depends on what you want your scene to look like. 
wireframe. This one's pretty cool. Basically, it just applies a wireframe view of the mesh when you turn it on. So we have our solid object. We turn it on. We compile. We now have a wireframe view of our sphere. And that's it. If I was to apply this and go into my scene itself, what we're going to do is we're going to see a little cube with a wireframe here that I've assigned. And of course, obviously, the default cube doesn't have a lot of vertexes, so it's going to look a little bit weird, assuming it finishes building here. I do have a cube in here, right? Yeah, right there. Okay. So there we go. So that's what my cube looks like in wireframe view. Obviously, because I don't have a lot of vertexes and edges, it's going to look a little bit weird. Plus, I have emissive light and eye adaption turned on. That's why it's fading in like that. So that's what wireframe does. It's kind of cool. It's a quick, easy way of getting a wireframe out of your model. Support accurate velocities from vertex. Basically, if you want this turned on, if you're going to be using this during motion and other things like that. Um, by default, you want to keep it on. The only reason you want to shut it off is if you're having issues or things aren't looking right when you're having this material moving. Our last option is a refraction depth bias. When you're using refraction, the items that you see through your refracted object are going to be offset based on your refraction value. Now the depth bias basically offsets that so that way certain things look different depending on how far away they are from your surface itself. This is a way of taking your existing refraction and then adjusting it slightly depending on how amplified you want the refraction effect to be. As you notice, of course, it's disabled because we don't have any refraction set up. We'd have to turn this over to like translucent and then we'd have to actually put in a value into our refraction. And then once we do that, we'll have a refraction depth bias enabled and then we can go ahead and adjust that as needed. So for example, if you have it set as a higher value, it's going to separate the refractions, causing them to visibly be separated from the surface and the refraction object. And it gives it more of a stylized and artistic approach. This is again one of those things where you want to tweak it based on if you're using refraction and you're not quite getting the effect you want. So those are all of our options for our material. It's, this was a long video, but you could think of the material property section as the, I've said this before, it's the template and it's the base instructions for your shader itself. It is your starting point. You determine your goal for your shader and you need to set it up inside of your material section. Every other one is basically a tweak. Your material section is your base. It is your frame for your material itself. If you need a surface one, surface, user interface, user frame. Because for example, let's say we go into our section here. And the nice thing is the materials for the most part will give you errors if you try to do something you're not supposed to. So if we take our image, and we over here, we see our image. Now the image can be a material or an image itself. So if we were to pull up one of our materials that we created for our examples, and let's say, I know I've got a material in here. Oh, let's shut off the engine content, make it a little easier. Oops. So here we go. So let's say we have our physics material when we go and apply it. You're going to notice it says the material does not use the UI material domain. And it'll ask you if you want to change it. And that's because that material is not set up for user interface. You're only going to be able to use user interface materials on the user interface. So keep that in mind. If you need a post-processing material, post-processing, standard materials are going to be surface, and then it goes on from there. Do you need to be able to see through it? It's translucent. Do you want it to mask maybe like a chain fence or a checkerboard? It's masked. Do you want it to be solid, non-translucent? Then it's opaque. Do you want to go ahead and add this item on top of something else? Then it's an additive mode. Do you want this to multiply? Then it's a modulate for the blend mode. What type of translucency you're going to use if it's a decal? Do you want this to absorb light or do you want it to emit light? Then you have unlit or default lit. Do you intend on using this for the surface of something? You have subsurface and pre-integrated skin. 
Is this for like a vehicle? You have clear coat. Are you going to use this on grass or trees or leaves? Well, not on a tree itself. You'd, For example, two-sided foliage would be the tree leaf. It wouldn't be the tree bark or the trunk itself. Are you going to use this on... You know what? While we're here, why not just as an end thing? Let's go ahead and launch 411. Just to show you what I mean by the other change. This is 411 Preview 1. Obviously, at the time of recording, 4.11 is not out itself. But if we open up, we're going to go ahead and we will see the example that I mean in terms of the other materials that they add in. So let's see. I think I was doing a, Let's try this one. Here's a material right here. If we go over here, you're now going to find we had up to two sided before. Now we have hair, cloth, and eye, which are more shady models that are being added in by Epic all the time. And these ones are intended to be used on, for example, Hair, it gives you special billboarding types. Cloth, which gives you kind of like a uh, physical feel to the cloth. As you can see here, it gives a little bit of sub um, subsurface effect for the cloth. And then eye, which gives some special effects and rendering techniques that are meant for eyes in terms of like a cornea and things like that. These will all be covered later in their own individual videos. And of course, when 4.11 becomes finalized i'll go ahead and cover those as well so that is our material property on our main material if you have any questions or comments please feel free to leave them below